Okay, please join me as we go before the throne. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for the day that's before us. Thank you for the opportunities that are before us. Dear Lord, you, you never leave us without work before us. You never leave us without opportunity before us. You never leave us, dear Lord, just floundering. You never leave us without calling us to another step. And dear Lord, whatever that step is, I ask that you help each and every one of us to step forward into it today. Dear Lord, as we, as we receive this message, I ask that you would open our hearts that we'd receive this message, we receive this message wholeheartedly, dear Lord, wide open heartedly, that we would the, the message would come home. And that as we as we receive this message about our view of you, Lord, that we that we would embrace it and we would do our best to grow it, that we would we would move forward with what you call us to do today, dear Lord, that we would receive that message. Dear Lord, we ask that right now you would, you, you would evict Satan. Dear Lord, you gave us the power by the blood of your son, by his, he gave us his power, every power he had. We can evict Satan and we can do it and we can do it right now. And dear Lord, I ask, us, ask that as we come together, we, we command Satan, Satan, you may not stay, you cannot stay, you must, you must leave. Not only must you leave our bodies, not only must you leave our minds, our hearts, not only must you leave there, but you must leave the premises. You cannot touch us. Satan, you are evicted in the, by the blood of Jesus Christ, by his command commands by his power we command you to leave you may have no hand whatsoever on this message none you have no mess no hand whatsoever on this seed that is planted you have no hand whatsoever on any one of us satan you must leave and father there are voids in us right now because satan has left and Father, I just ask that you'd fill us. You'd fill us with your Holy Spirit. That you just pour into us with your Holy Spirit. That all those voids, we'd feel your Spirit coming into us. We'd feel your Spirit filling us. We'd feel your Spirit overflowing us, dear Lord. That we would be refreshed. Refreshed to receive the word that you have for us here today, dear Lord. Refreshed to receive it. And Father... In that spirit, we pray. We pray for the Rod Anderson's family, for Rustin's family, for his, his, all of his loved ones, dear Lord. We pray that in his death, that life would come. We pray that in his death, healing would come. Dear Lord, we pray that, that the entire, all those around him, Rod and, and his bride and, and all the kids and, and the cousins and the aunts, the uncles, the loved ones, the buddies, that, Lord, there be healing through this time. It seems unfair, Lord, but the reality is we ask for healing through it because we know you will do something with it. And so, Father, we ask that his death would not just be a death, but it would be a new beginning. We ask that his death would not just be a death that's not a wasted life, but instead it would be a life that impacts other lives for the kingdom. Father, we ask that, that uh, you'd have your hand on Shanette, and, and she's going on that respirator. Lord, she's struggling, and it's heartbreaking, it's heart-wrenching. It's, it's just it's challenging for us to accept that and to, to, to believe that that's okay. But the reality is, dear Lord, we ask that you have your hand on it. Because we know you can do miracles. You do miracles all the time. We oftentimes brush them off. We don't believe that it was a miracle. We just say that was lucky. But Lord, the reality is you, you perform miracles daily through us. And we just ask for another miracle right now. We ask for a miracle right now that Shanette would be healed. Your hand would be upon her. If we can have our say, if we'd be allowed to have a little say on behalf of Jeanette, we ask that you, you would perform a miracle and you would take her off, keep her away from the respirator, you, 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 you would heal her. Now, dear Lord, we also know that you have a plan and we don't get it. We're not even close to understanding it. So, Father, if your plan does not include coming off the respirator. The Father, I ask that you would have your hand on each and every person around Shanette. That once again there would be growth. 
growth in love, growth in faith, growth in healing, growth in your promises for us, dear Lord. Father, we just we just are so grateful, so thankful for all that you do in our lives, and we're so grateful and thankful for all you've done so far. And Father, we just look forward to what you're going to do as we move forward. And we just pray all these things in your loving Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. And if you would join me in the prayer that our Savior taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. What a beautiful day we have before us. Today we're going to talk about our view of God. But before that, before we do that, I want to talk about our view of Legos. I know it just fits right in with God, doesn't it? I mean, it's just like it's there, right? Um, so Legos are they're these amazing things, right? They're these these things that. Um, I mean, you could create so many things with them, and some of those things are extremely cool, aren't they? And 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 then the other beautiful side of these is it teaches us patience and and repentance, because we step on the little ones in the middle of the night, when we're on our way to the bathroom, and then we repent for those thoughts and words that we just used, because they hurt, right? But but these things are so incredible, and the people who people who use these uh, can be so creative. Uh, Legos started in 1962 they started producing legos right and since 1962 on average every year they've created 130 new sets now that's not we sold 130 units it's they created another 130 new sets so thank you star wars thank you minecraft thank you et whatever right for all the sets they created on those those things, right? And so, but these Legos are just, they're, they're such an incredible thing. Um, and, and so, so far, they've got approximately 7,800 different sets that you can buy. That's, you go to, the bo- you go to the store and you get like 10 in a box, or you get 20 in a box, or 100, or, or if you're, you're Blake or Grayson, you get the ones with like 500 in a box, right? Um, and, and so, but those are the ones that are, they, they make this and this alone. Now, what I think is really incredible is the people who are creative beyond creative. And they create things like this. This is called the abandoned house. That's all Legos. And it's three stories tall. Not even kidding, right? There's 130,000 bricks. They call these bricks. 130,000 bricks in that house. Took them 450 hours to put that house together. 450. Can you imagine playing with Legos for 450 hours? I think my mom would have been mad, right? But but this is an adult that did this, so I guess mom didn't have a say. Um, so but that's pretty impressive. But 130,000 of these little demons, right? And so so then then there's another one that I really like. All Legos. USS Missouri, it's a battleship. Wait a minute, what, a couple weeks ago, it seems to me we talked something about a battleship, didn't we? That the church should be a battleship, not a cruise ship. When we get it right with our lordship, we'll be the battleship, remember? That's why I really like this one. But this one, see all these little things? Them are, them are people. They got the people on a deck, man. I mean, they do so down to the detail on this thing. Over 500,000 Legos. Over 500,000 Legos, it took him 2,160 hours to make this. One guy did it all by himself. He's like, nope. Even when he was offered help, he said, mm no. Uh, it, so the mistakes are mine, but the glory's mine also, right? That's where he was at. And so, but 2,160 hours f- to make that. That's, and that thing is amazing. It's 26 feet long. This isn't just your coffee table, right? It's 26 feet. It's the largest ship made with Legos to to that date, which is, uh, I believe it was 2017, if I remember right, or 2018. 
Um, so anyway, so then, then there's, there's another one. That, this is pretty impressive, but, but the one I like even better is this next one. This is the London, uh, 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 the Land Rover Tower Bridge. What Land, Land Rover did was they went to, it was called um, Bright Bricks. They went to a company called Bright Bricks and commissioned them to build the largest structure ever built with Legos. Largest structure ever. And so, but then there was some other stuff to go with it, right? Because it can't just be just build whatever structure. They wanted to build the Tower Bridge. And then they said when it's built, when it's done, completed, we want to be able to drive our new Land Rover Discovery up on it. Those are not Lego cars. And they drove them up on top of this Lego structure. That's pretty impressive. That's, that's, I'm like, Grayson, by the way, your work's cut out. I want one of them for Christmas next year. Just saying. And so, uh, I'm just, I'm just, Blake can help you. It's fine. Um, grandma will pay for the bricks. And so, uh, but, uh, this thing, you want to talk about a, a set? And, and now mind you, these three are not sets, right? These are not part of that 7,800 sets. This is people using their brains and their creativity to make these, right? Almost 6 million bricks in that almost six million now if, if you're one of them bean counter people it's actually only five million eight hundred and five thousand eight hundred and forty six bricks but almost six million in there and it took them a year to s- construct this thing now in reward for that they got their name in the guinness book of world records for the largest lego structure ever created pretty impressive stuff i'm just like man this stuff is so cool right now This is a eight stud Lego. Uh, that's why I got the bigger ones out. Eight stud Lego, so you could see it, right? That's what they call it. Eight stud brick. They had a mathematician do the math on if we took six of these, six eight stud Legos, and put them together, how many different combinations could you have by stacking these together in whatever sort of way? And I'll take three guesses at the number. Who wants to guess? How many? How many combinations do you think? Nope, you got to go a bit higher, a lot bit higher. Yes? Oh, you go a lot higher. A lot higher. You already had your hand up. And it's higher. Six of these with eight studs in all the different combinations, over 915 million combinations with six of these. Grayson, I got your work cut out for you. You can have Blake help you on this one too. I would like to see pictures of all 915 million uh, combinations by Christmas as well, okay? Your mom likes taking pictures. It'll be fine. Um, so, <laughs> so <laughs> Steve doesn't want those pictures shared with him. So, um, so anyway, so these eight sets, so that's kind of crazy, isn't it? And at first, at first I thought, there's no way. But then when you start thinking about all the different ways they could lock all these things together, oh, my land, these are amazing. Now, now, what if I were to say, let's take some Legos and let's create God? What if I said, let's take some Legos and create God according to our vision of God? Some of y'all would be like, you can't do it. And here's the thing I want to share with you. You're already doing it. Each and every one of us is already doing it. Each and every one of us continues to add our brick to our view of who God is. And we do it day in and day out. So guess what? The older we are, the more bricks we've added as to who our God is. Psalm 145, verse 1 through 3 says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. His greatness no one can fathom. 
That's the NIV. The NLT says no one can measure his greatness. The Amplified says it is incomprehensible to measure his greatness. Six, eight stud Legos, 915 plus million combinations. We can fathom that, yet our scriptures tell us we can't even fathom the greatness of our Lord, yet we continue to put blocks together, bricks together, to create our God. St. Augustine wrote, if you could, if you could envision who God is, if you could, if you could comprehend him, if you could, well, it's not God. We can't even imagine how incredible our God is. We can't even imagine it. This is a big deal. We need, to, we need to understand this. We need to understand who and what God is. We need to understand who and what God is because who God is to us and what God is, is to us is the life that we will live. It's the life that we'll live. It, 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 is, it, it is the marriage that we'll have. It's, it's the, the work that we'll do. It's the relationships we'll grow. It's not only is it the work we'll do, but it's also why we'll work or why we won't work. Our God will create, the God that we have, that we continue to add bricks to, creates everything about our life. Our vision of God creates everything about our life. A.W. Tozer said, whatever comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Let me repeat that. Whatever comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. The thing that drives and rules our life is who our God is. So whatever we've been putting together for our God is our life. Whatever it is, and that is what will come to mind, who, who we have as a God in our mind is, is what will come to mind, in our heart I should say, is what will come to mind when we think about God. And that's the God that the people around us will see. How about, I'm going to help you visualize this a little bit. Um, have you ever heard this statement? But they were too old, young, middle-aged to die, right? They, you have someone who dies at 75. You have someone who dies middle-aged, 50s. Um, you have someone who dies uh, in their 20s. You have someone who dies um, who's, who's a toddler, a baby, an infant, dies in the womb, right? They die, and, and you hear this. If God's so loving, why would he let this happen? If God's so loving, why would he do this? Our vision of God, and we had a brick. How about this? Have you heard this? Uh, but, but God, I just, I've done so much bad. I've done so much wicked. I've done so much evil. God could never forgive me. He would never be able to forgive me. And we add another brick of our God. We just continue to add them on. How about, how about this? Our, our view of our life? What we think of our Sabbath and what God calls us to. How about what we think about serving we just talked about serving opportunities, right? What we think about serving, and we add another brick. Oh, let's, let's get close to the corn. What we think about tithing. How about, how about what we think about forgiving that person that did that thing that was so bad? And we continue to add brick after brick after brick to build our God. And this is exactly, this is exactly why we need to reassess, reevaluate, reunderstand, rethink who God is. Who is our God? And what's he mean to us? Do we have a tiny little ugly brick God? Or do we have the almighty God? 
And that's why, that's why we're doing this series. That's why we're doing this message today. Romans 8, 31 through 39 says this. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Hello. If God's got your back, there's nobody going to get at you. If God is for us, who can be against us? Satan cannot, def- cannot defeat God. The only way God, you can be defeated is you, if you allow Satan to defeat you. If you embrace him instead of the good Lord. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Wait a minute. How many of y'all are here that are here would be willing to take your son and sacrifice him for somebody else? How many have heard someone's going into the military, but why would you do that? Why would you? You might get killed to go and save the freedoms of this country, but also to save freedoms of other countries, save those who are being persecuted, right? But why would we, well, don't sacrifice your life for them. But God said, guess what? All these people who hate me, despise me, ignore me, reject me, all these people who spit upon me, I'm going to send my son there. I'm going to sacrifice my son for him. And Jesus said, Dad, I'll go. Let's do it. He did not spare his own son. Who will bring in charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Jesus is up there. He's doing it right now. He's interceding for us each and every day. Every time we put one of these bricks on, he's interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for the sake we, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from God's love. And that's some good news, folks. That's some good news. Nothing, no matter what you've done, it cannot separate you from God's love. Nothing could separate us from God's love, except for us. Because you see, it's either Yahweh or your way. Either God's God or we're God. And if we reject God, if we do this, that's the only way you'll be separated from God. And he'll still love you. He'll still love you even if you walk away. What matters is what we got going on here is always a reflection of here. So if we have God here in our lives, if he's here, he'll be, it's because he's here. If the world is here, then the world is also here. We're created in the image of God. We're created in the image of God. And we're doing one of three things at all times. We're either walking with him, we're walking without him, or we're walking away from him. We're doing one of those three things at all times. We're walking with God, without God, or away from God. It's our choice what we do. Here's the thing. I don't give a rip what the government says. I am so done with that. I used to worry about what the government said. I don't give a rip about what the government says. You know what? I don't care what Wall Street does. I don't care anymore. And it's not out of arrogance. It's not out of that at all. But you know what? I I care less what they say, what they do. All I care about is what God says, what God does. That's what's important. Because God is my God, not Wall Street, not the government. In fact, our Bible tells us the government rests on his shoulders in Isaiah 9, 6, right? Uh, the government rests on his shoulders. Whose shoulders? Jesus' shoulders. The government rests on our God's shoulders. It does not rest on our shoulders. When these lifelong politicians, these lifelong civic leaders, 
when they're claiming, oh, it's all this weight's on me. Oh, it's about, I got to do this for us. They ain't doing diddly. It's on God's shoulders. It's not on their shoulders. They're, they don't even know God. And yeah, I'll say that over and over again. They don't know God because if they think it's on their shoulders, it proves they don't know the word. And it proves God is not their God. See, we can't, we can't walk with God and ignore the word. We can't. We can't, we can't read the word, walk with God, and then say, but my opinion is this is what the word should say. Well, he must have meant that. Oh, that was 2,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago or what, depending on what part. We don't get to have an opinion about it. It is what it is. It's God's word. So either we're with God or we're with ourselves. We can't walk with God and be in charge. We can't do it. We cannot walk with God and be in charge of our own lives. God has to be in charge of our life. The Holy Spirit will not allow us, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, will not allow us to make our opinion our authority. It'll be this word that is the authority, not this one. When the Holy Spirit fills us, God will be in charge of our life, not us in charge of our life. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit. When God is our God and not just some Legos. See, the Holy Spirit, when, when we have Christians who are, who are doing this all the time, Always fighting, can't get along, always, always down on, I mean, you did this, and you, you did that, and whatever. And we're doing this all the time, but we're supposedly we're Christians. I've got to tell you this. you got two people who are doing that all the time, and they're claiming to be Christians. At least one, if not both, are not Christians. They're not walking with God. I don't care what they claim. I don't care what badge they put on. The Holy Spirit will not allow us to walk like this. The Holy Spirit teaches us to walk like this in unity. God's bride walks in unity. The world's bride, however, does a whole lot of this. Jesus said in John 13, 35, he said, and you will know their mind by their, and yes, love. And you'll know their mind by their love. This is not love. If you have someone who's, who's talking, if, if, if I'm talking bad about you and you're not here, I certainly hope she comes and says, hey, 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 no, knock it off. What she needs to do as a Christian is say, no, let's, let's call up and let's all three talk together, but you don't get to talk to me about her, right? Right? I mean, you could praise someone. You'd be like, well, you can't believe how wonderful this, that, whatever, right? But when you're tearing people down, you're talking bad about people, you're degrading people, you're, they, they, the scriptures calls that gossip. And it also calls it sin. And we need to call it out if we're truly a Christian, if we're walking in with God as our God. And we don't have this for a God. So there's three truths about love, about God's love. First truth is God's love is unconditional. God's love's unconditional. There's no strings attached. He loved us when we were spitting on him. He loved us when we were lashing him. He loved us when we were spiking him to the cross. He loved us when we were denying him. There are no strings attached to God's love. And we don't get it because we always got strings attached. Well, I loved you until you said that. You know, I really loved you until, well, you remember that time you did that thing? Well, I loved you except for, well, you got the wrong color car. You put that flag up in your house. You said that thing. Oh, my hair didn't look good. And suddenly we don't love. We'll stay married until I can't stand you. We'll stay married until you say the wrong thing. You don't cook the meal the right way. You don't mow the grass quite right. We got strings attached to our love. 
That's why we don't understand God's, God's love, because there's no strings attached. So let's cut some strings. Let's get rid of the strings. Why do we, why, why do we want to be puppets? Why do we want to be tethered? Why do we want to be distraught because of somebody else? Let's love as God loves with no strings. William Bennett, former Secretary of Education, says, uh, he, he tells a story in his book, uh, Book of Virtues, A Treasury of Great Moral Stories. He talks about being at a wedding for this couple, and this couple had, um, they had altered their vows to um, reflect their love of convenience, as he puts it, which means, you know what that means, right? Prenuptials and all that kind of thing, right? All their vows were tied to, if you do this, I'll do that, whatever kind of thing, right? And he says in the book, he says, so he, he didn't give him the gift that he had for him that day. Instead, when he got home, he sent him a gift. That gift was a stack of paper plates. He figured it would last longer than their marriage because of all the strings attached to their love. In this world, we, we think that we got to earn everything, everything. We got to earn it, earn it, earn it. Oh, the only way I get to the top is if I earn it. Oh, I, gotta, I get the new car because I earned it. I get the new uh, blah, blah, blah. I get their love because I earned it. Love's free. You can't be earned, by the way. But God says what? He says, not in your life, but on my life, you'll receive my love. We think we got to earn love all the time. It's not our life. It was Jesus Christ's life. It was Jesus Christ's life. That, we, we get God's love, no strings attached. No strings attached. Ephesians 2 verse, uh, verse 8 says, For it is by God's grace that we are saved. By God's grace we are saved. The word for grace here is uh, charis, which means a gift that can only be distributed by God for our benefit. The grace of God is a gift that can only be distributed by him for our benefit. It's also where the word favor comes from. And, and God favored us and gave us grace through his son, Jesus Christ, and through the cross that he hung upon. I think he favored us pretty heavily, didn't he? Can I get an amen? Now, look, I, we're, we're not perfect people. I'm not, I'm not a perfect father. I'm not a perfect grandfather, much as I would love to be. The reality is I make mistakes. I make them all the time. My daughters, they're not perfect. And don't you dare say, yeah, you know, especially if you're married to them. <laughs> um, my sons, they're not perfect. My grandchildren, they're not perfect. And when they make their mistakes, you know what? I still love them. When I make my mistakes, they still love me. Why? Because I'm still their daddy. I'm still their papa. I still love them. How much greater is God's love than our love? I can't even come close to even slightly imagining the magnitude of God's love for us. But I know how much I love them, right? I know how much I love my bride. And yet God's love is like, that's nothing. That's a brick, <laughs> you know? We got six million more to go, right? And so, or more, right? Got an affinity to go of them, right? And so, God's love is so much greater than ours, and he showed it through the cross. There's a story in the Bible that um, gives a great picture to God's love, and that's, that's in Luke 15, the prodigal son. In Luke 15, uh, if you know the prodigal son, maybe you haven't read it for a while, you don't remember, whatever. Maybe you've never read it. I don't know. Um, but so in the prodigal son, uh, uh, the, the youngest son comes to his dad. There's two boys. The youngest one comes to his dad and says, Dad, I want my inheritance. I want it now not willing to wait till the day you die. And what in reality that means in that day is, Dad, I wish you were dead because all I care about is the values, the valuables. I want the riches. And even though the father has been slighted in a big way, he, he grants the son's wish and the son takes off and the son goes and he parties it up. He takes his half the inheritance. He goes, he parties down. He's boozing it. He's, che he's, he's womanizing it. He's doing all those things. All those wonderful sins that we have so much fun doing. And by the way, sin is fun. Let's be honest, that's, the devil does that on purpose. He creates fun sin because if it wasn't fun, we wouldn't want to do it. 
and he wouldn't be able to get us away from God. You know how it is. You know, it's like, hey, guys, you want to go get drunk tonight? No, it's not the right thing. But, yeah, let's go. It'll be fun. Right? And I can tell you because I've walked that walk. And then at the end of the night, you're all, you, you've been doing it. You've been hammered. You've been puking wherever. You've been passed out wherever. You've been doing them stupid things that you should never have done. You would never have done when you were sober. And afterwards, guess what? The devil, he's got some strings. And he says, hey, you remember when, when God said you shouldn't do that? And then you, you just did that? Guess what? <laughs> he doesn't love you. And he just pushes you down. Hey, you know, you, you know all them things you did, the things you really should never have done, you would never have done when you were sober? God's not going to forgive you for those. It was way too bad for him to forgive you for those. And he pushes you down. And he continues to push you down and push you down with all of his lies. And the next thing you know, what? You want to go get drunk again. Why? Because you want to forget about all the, the failures, the shortcomings, the sins of your life. The things I've already done that were bad. And trust me, again, this is from personal experience. Oftentimes, most of the time, I was partying to try to hide the embarrassment, the humiliation, the failings that I had in my life. I was trying to hide them not only from people, but from God. And you can't hide it. But the devil will tell you you can. And he's telling you, it's a good time. Come on, let's party down. Think about it. The sins in life, they're a good time. So the son goes. He enjoys a good time. When it gets to the point he's run out of all his valuables and now he's slopping the pigs and the pods that he's feeding the pigs look good because he can't afford food, he decides he'd go home and be a servant, an employee of his father so that he can eat better than what he's eating now. So he goes home and when he's he's a ways off, the father still sees him because the father is looking and the father sees him and runs out and he wraps his robe around his shoulders. He puts his ring upon his finger. They slaughter the fatty calf. They celebrate party downtime because my son has come home. That father is God. That son is us. And when we return to the Father, when we come back to our Father, the Father runs out because he's been watching for us. He's been waiting for us to return home. And he comes out and he celebrates. And we party down, right? In a godly way. Okay? It doesn't matter what we've done. The Father didn't care what the Son did when he went and spent his inheritance. He didn't care when he said... God, you don't matter to me. I want to have me a good time. Did it hurt? Yeah. But he waited every moment from the time the boy left to wait until the boy came back. He was watching for him. Now, there's a second son in this story. If you'll remember, there's the older boy. And everyone else is inside celebrating, and the older boy is being a jerk. And he's fuming and he's mad and he's upset. And the father says, what's going on, man? And he goes, you never threw a party like this for me. I've been here the whole time. I've been here all along. You never partied for me. And the father says, you've got everything that's mine is yours. Everything that's mine is yours. You know who that older son is? The church. That older son is the church, and the church sits there and looks at those who strayed. And the church sits there and goes, but they don't deserve eternity with God. They don't, they don't deserve redemption. They don't deserve it because I've been here the whole time. I've been a Christian my whole life. I'm 78 years old, and I've been a Christian my whole life. I've been in church every Sunday. And they're going to get to go to heaven just like me? That's not fair. That's the church today. It's disgusting. But the father still loved the older son. The father still loved the older son. He still loves the older son today. Does he want him to have a different heart? Absolutely. And the older son is just as far away from the father as the younger son was. And that's the sad part of our church today. We're as far away from our father as the lost those who don't even know God at all. They're not any farther away than what the church today is. 
There's nothing we can do to get God to love us a little more. There's nothing we can do to get God to love us a little more. Nothing. Not a thing. Paul says in Ephesians 2, four, five, uh, 2 verse 4 and 5, says, but because of his great love for us, God, is, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. It's by grace you've been saved. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, right? We learned that when we were a kid, right? Uh, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, it's the book for me, right? We learned these songs when we were little tiny kids, right? The truth of the matter is the B-I-B-L-E will lead us to Jesus Christ each and every time. And he's the one for me. And he's the one who saved me. And he's the one who saved you. And his love for us is unimaginable, incomprehensible. God loves you. God loves you. There's nothing you or I can do to make him stop loving us. The second thing is God's love is in, in, unimaginable. It's unimaginable. Ephesians 3.19. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Wow. Think about it, that. To know it, it makes no sense to us, does it? How the, how, the world, how the world looks at things, how we grasp things. Man, we, 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 it just doesn't make sense that, the, that this love that surpasses knowledge. He, it, it, how about this one? He who knew sin, who knew no sin, became sin so that I might be his righteous, so that we could become his righteousness. Jesus went to that cross. He took our sin, that we could be cleaned, pure as snow. Tony Campalo, in the, in the book, uh, The Kingdom of God is a Party, uh, Tony talks of, of flying from Pennsylvania on the East Coast to Hawaii for an engagement over there. Um, and so he, 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 there's some hours there, right? And, and we know how time travel work, or I mean, time, time zones work, right? And so Tony's not able to sleep. So he's in the middle of the night. He's, he's up pacing. So he goes, does what a lot of people do, goes for a walk. And so he's out for a walk, 3 o'clock in the morning. He comes across this greasy spoon diner. You know the kind, the, one, the ones where you know, you'd rather eat off the floor than the counter, right? I'm just saying, right? It's kind of not a clean place. He comes across this diner that's still open um, at 3 o'clock in the morning, and, and the only person in there is the guy behind the counter. Tony goes in. He orders a burger. They're talking, just the small talk kind of stuff. And in about 3.30, everything changes. There's this group of prostitutes comes in. Five, five prostitutes come in, and they sit down behind him. And, and they're back there talking, and one of the prostitutes is telling all the other four that, that tomorrow's her birthday, and she's never had a birthday party. Never in life has she had a birthday party. And they continue talking, and about a half hour later, they end up leaving. And when they leave, Tony looks at the guy behind the counter. turns out it's, he's the owner. Um, he looks at the owner and he says, ah, I got an idea. Let's throw a party for Agnes, because he'd found out the gal's name was Agnes. He says, let's throw a birthday party tomorrow night for Agnes. And, and the owner's like, dude, yeah, let's check it out. My specialty is birthday cakes. <laughs> you own a Greasy Spoon restaurant. I don't know that you're at your, your specialty is birthday cakes. But he offered to make the, he's like, yeah, let's do it. This is a great idea. And here's what Tony shares. Tony says, <clears throat> at 2.30 a.m. the next morning, I came back to the diner. I had picked up some crepe paper decorations and made a sign that read, Happy Birthday, Agnes. Somehow, word must have gotten out because at, by 3 a.m., every hooker in Honolulu was in the joint. Wall-to-wall -wall prostitutes and me, a preacher. <laughs> and so imagine the uncomfort zone there. Uh, I'm not sure for who, worse. But um, at, at 3.30 a.m., the door of the diner swung open, and in came Agnes and her friends. But I had everybody ready, and when she, when she did, we all screamed, Happy birthday! Never have I seen a person so flabbergasted. Her mouth fell open, her legs buckled, and when we finished singing, tears began flowing down her cheeks. And when the man behind the counter brought out the cake he had baked, she started to sob. When someone yelled, blow out the candles, she asked if she could keep it, not wanting anyone to eat. She said she lived around the corner, and she was going to take the cake back there, but she would be right back. When she walked out, the place was deathly quiet. And without thinking, I simply asked if I could, if I could pray. I prayed for Agnes that she would know the love of Jesus and that her life would never be the same. When I finished, the guy behind the counter said, hey, you never said you were a preacher. What kind of a church do you belong to? And the only thing I could say was, I belong to the kind of church that throws parties for hookers at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> it 
It was then the guy behind the counter sneered and said, no, you don't. Well, if there was one like that, I'd join it. If there was one like that, I'd join it. Wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all? The church acts so much like the older brother. If instead, we'd act like Christ. Wouldn't we all? I mean, we, we all, we're all hookers. Let's be honest. We all go and prostitute ourselves. We're all looking for God's love, but we're not looking to God for his love. We're prostituting ourselves in our sin and all the things that we're doing, looking in all the wrong places for God's love over and over again. And there's not a person in here who, can't t- who could tell me, and I would believe you, that you've never, ever done it. We've all looked for God's love in the wrong places. That's the kind of church we need to be. Instead of sleeping around trying to find God's love. Instead, just coming to God himself for his love. Coming back to God himself. John 11, verse 7 through 9 says, Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths below. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. His love. We can't even come close to imagine it. Uh, There's a Jesuit priest uh, named Howard Gray said this. He said, God's love makes no sense if you use the criteria of this world. And he's absolutely right. God's love, it doesn't make sense when we're judging it by the world's standards. We gotta cut our strings. We gotta embrace God's love. We gotta go to God for his love. I want you to understand this. When we trust Yahweh and not your way, everything changes. When we trust Yahweh and not your way, everything changes. Your life will never be the same when you trust Yahweh. I want you to understand this. And most of you know this. Well, okay, I'm I'm not going to say most of you know this because I'm assuming some things. But here's the thing. That's why I say, what, someone's got an alcohol addiction? (laughs) Welcome home. We love you. Someone's got an addiction with porn? Welcome home. You're loved. Someone's got got problems figuring out their gender. Welcome home. You're loved. No matter what you're struggling with, no matter what you're demon, guess what? Welcome home. You're loved because here Jesus lives. And here Jesus loves I just want you to know that welcome home. See, the last thing is God's love is inseparable. It's inseparable. It's going nowhere. It's, it's, it's here. I want to do a favor. And I forgot your name, buddy. Huh? Nico, yes, Nico, buddy, you want to come on up here? Gabby, you want to come up here? Draven? Sorry, I said Gavin, didn't I? Ah, See, I got two of you wrong today. Come on up here. I want to show you a little something. See, I want to show you what God's love looks like, okay? And sometimes these little eye-catching demonstrations are a little better, right? And and so, so God's love, the Holy Spirit leads us, and all he does is leads us to unity, right? He doesn't lead us to division. He doesn't pull us apart. He brings us to unity. I got, I have, come on over on this side, Nico. Okay, I want you to grab this arm right here. Both hands. Go ahead. Both hands. I want you to grab this one. Both hands. Okay? Now, God's love, never, it's inseparable. You can't pull it apart. You guys go ahead and try pulling my hands apart. No matter what the world's doing, no matter how the world's pulling us, no matter how Satan's doing his thing, right? We're inseparable from God's love. Okay, you're good. I don't want anyone else falling, and plus my hands were slipping a little. I didn't want to look bad. So, you know, I picked the two little guys. And so, thank you very much, gentlemen. You can head on back to your seats. That's God's love, right? You, can't, you just can't separate it. There's no pulling it apart. 
They could have pulled all day. It's not coming apart. Again, why I picked the little guys, right? Um, but that's, that's God's love. That's a picture of God's love. He's there for us. He's with us all the time. No matter what we do, he loves us. And the only way we can be separated from God is when we stiff arm instead of lock arms. It's the only way. And even when we stiff arm God, he still loves us, even if we're hating on him. God loves us. Jeremiah 31 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting, which is an unending and eternal sort of love. Romans 8 39 says, Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing can. Elise Fitzpatrick says, If you're not completely convinced that his love is ours right now, fully and unalterably, unalterably ours, we will always hide in the shadows, be focused on our performance, fearing his wrath, for we are each one more sinful and flawed than we ever dared believe, but more loved and welcomed than we ever dared hope. Even when we're cowering in a corner in the shadows because we think we're so wicked and unlovable, God still loves us. There's no avoiding it. You can't get away from it. He still loves us. Our mission here, this bride, this body, our mission is to make sure that people understand that even though your life doesn't make sense, even though it doesn't make sense, why would God love you right now? Why, how could he possibly love you? Even when they, they believe that there's, well, there's no way God will forgive me for this. There's no way. Even when they, they don't get it, they don't understand the world they're in, they don't understand God's love. Even when they don't understand it, we have to remember that, that God isn't focused on performance. He's not focused on performance. He's focused on his love for us. He's focused on what his son did for us. He's focused on us being the son that comes back, or daughter, that comes back home. And he invites each and every one of us to come back home, and that's our mission here. There should be never a person that walks through that door that does not feel the love of Jesus Christ in this room does not feel the Holy Spirit in this room. Our mission when we're out there is that when people meet us, when they see us, when they interact with us, they would see Jesus Christ. They would see, they would feel God's love. It's not about us. It's about him and his love. It's about our God, our unimaginable God, our unbelievable God, our we don't get it God. We need to help them to understand the who and what that God is. That's what our mission is, is to get them to understand that when they, when, when they understand who and what God is, nothing else matters. The world's totally different. When our focus is on God and we understand God. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. This has nothing to do with this story. is not about who's in the White House. It's not about who's in Mickey Mouse, uh, Mickey Mouse with Disneyland. It does not about that. It's not about who's on Wall Street. It's not about who's in office in government. It's not about any of that. It's just who's in our house. Who's in God's house. That's what it's about. Today we talk about freedom, right? In the United States, a woo, great America. The most sinful country in the world as far as I'm concerned. A country that's based off of Christianity and is farther from Christianity than any other country in the world other than those who don't claim to be Christians. It's not about the United States. It's not about that freedom. It's about our freedom in Christ. It's about our freedom in God. It's about our freedom in the love of the Lord who's waiting for us to return home. And that's our mission is to share that with those who come here. A God who loves them in, in unconditionally, unimaginably, and inseparably ways. Ways they can't even fathom. 
ways that are incomprehensible. Share one last thing with you. The issue of your identity and your authority are related. Your identity and your authority are related. See, the thing is, whoever you, whoever you allow to author your story is your authority. Whoever you allow to author your story is your authority. Is God authoring your story? Or are you or the world authoring your story? Please join me as we go before the Lord. Dear Lord, thank you. Father, sometimes it's kind of hard to hear some of this stuff. Father, so we, we just don't get it. We just don't understand it. I mean, we, we don't even come close. We can't. We really can't fathom your love, your, your mercy, your forgiveness. We, we just don't get it. We truly, we, we, I'm, Lord, as much as we try, sometimes we think, man, I really know how to love now. But the reality is we still don't even have it. We don't even have one of them six million bricks when it comes compared to your love, dear Lord. Man, I really, I know how to forgive people. I could forgive really well. And we still don't have one of those forgiveness bricks out of your six million. Father, we, we, we just, we don't even get it. We don't, we don't understand it, but that's okay. You said we never will. Our plans are not your plans. Our ways are not your ways. We cannot think as you think. So we get that. We can't love as you love but we can allow your grace to pour through us, dear Lord. And I ask that you help each and every one of us that as we walk away from here, as we go out and we're the church, where the church is supposed to be the church at, not in this, not in this building, but out there in the world that you have us in. Father, I ask that you help each and every one of us to just, just be a conduit of your grace, a conduit of your love, a conduit of your forgiveness that we'd allow yours to flow through us because we don't get it. We can't even come close to it. And so, Father, I just ask that you help each and every one of us as we go forward, that we cut the strings that Satan has on us. We cut the strings that we put on ourselves. We cut the strings that we allow others to put on us. That, Father, instead, instead, we would live string-free according to your plan. And that we would, we would share your love. We would share your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness. Father, I'm so grateful for every opportunity you put before me. Father, I'm so grateful for every opportunity you put before each and every one of us. Not just today, but every day. Father, I ask that you would help us Help us to embrace those opportunities, though. Instead of stiff arming, stiff arming them, we would instead we'd interlock arms with them. That we would step forward instead of questioning and doubting. Instead of listening to Satan, we cut those strings and we just take those steps. And we do exactly what it is you're calling us to do. Father, I look forward. I look forward to seeing your hand on each and every person here. I look forward to seeing your hand in our community as we continue to go out and we continue to live out the mission, the mission that we've all prostituted ourselves and you still loved us and we should show those who are still doing it your love, dear Lord, that we would introduce them to your love, that we'd share your word, your gospel, your son, your greatness to them, Father. Father, I just thank you. I thank you so much for what you've already done and what you're going to do. And I just pray all these things in your loving Son, Jesus Christ's name.